Our, uh, our theme scripture for us today, as we gather in worship, comes from 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 39. It says, when all the people saw this, we'll find out what this is. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Let's read that together. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. So this is the third week of Are We There Yet? Uh, as we think about vacations this summer, we talked about going to the beach and the water and all that for a while. We talked about going to the mountains these last three weeks. This is the last week of that. Next week, we're doing family reunions. Shouldn't that be fun? Okay, we'll see how that goes. But anyway, uh, so we did uh, Mount Moriah to start with, which is Jerusalem, in Jerusalem with Abraham, and Mount Sinai last week with Moses, and now today, Mount Carmel. So on this map, uh, Mount Moriah uh, is right kind of in the middle. Jerusalem is there. That's where uh, Mount Moriah is. It's right at the top of the mustard color, if you can see Jerusalem on the map. Mount Sinai from last week with Moses is off the bottom of the map. So that's uh, way to the south. And Mount Carmel is the little red circle at the top of the map. So it's right on the Mediterranean coastline. And it's the beginning, Mount Carmel, of a whole ridge that runs all the way over to the, uh, to the uh, Sea of Galilee, which is the little light blue circle there in the midst of the dark blue, all right, in the middle of the kingdom of Israel. So we're going to meet, we're going to be at Mount Carmel today. We're going to meet a guy named Elijah. Elijah is a prophet of God. Elijah's name means uh, Yahweh is God. So you can kind of see that on the screen as I kind of parallel those. Elijah is the name. El is the generic name for God. And Yah is Yahweh. There's no J in Hebrew, so it's actually Eliah, but we call him Elijah in English. So it's El Yah, the Lord is God. God, God is Yahweh. All right, that's who the God is. And if you remember, I don't know if you remember this, but back years before, God had appeared to Moses at the burning bush. Moses had asked God, what is your name? And God said, my name is Yahweh. I am that I am, Yahweh. So uh, there you go. So Elijah's name is that Yahweh is God. That's what his name means. And that's important for the story because that's in contention in this story, whether or not, in fact, Yahweh is God, or whether some other God is the real God. That's disputed in the story. So a couple other characters we need to know. Uh, one is Ahab. Ahab is the king of Israel during the days of Elijah. Now here's how the Bible introduces Ahab to us. See if you like this said about you. Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. That's the first thing we read about Ahab in the Bible. Great guy, apparently. How would you like to be introduced like that? I hope not. There's more. Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord. Whenever there's a Lord, by the way, the capital letters Lord in the Bible, that's it's true. It's how we read what the original was Yahweh. So originally, Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of Yahweh, is the original Hebrew, than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, don't worry about him, but he also married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. So we meet a couple more characters here. We meet Jezebel. Ahab married Jezebel. That's kind of going to be important for us to remember. Why did he do that? Well, if you check out our map again, Ahab is the king of Israel, the dark blue on the map. Way up at the top, along the Mediterranean coastline, is Sidon. The, the city of Sidon. Ahab's first job, the job of any leader, is to protect his people. And he's got a problem on the northern flank up in modern day Lebanon. So Hezbollah is not there yet, but the Sidonians are. He's got a problem there, they could attack him. And so what he does is he marries Jezebel, the daughter of the king of Sidon, and thereby protects his northern border. It's a great strategy. Maybe. So during the time of King Ahab then, for Israel, the people that lived there, there was, it was a time of great prosperity because he made these alliances and they had nobody attacking them on any side. If there were elections, Ahab would have won every one of them hands down without even cheating. Great job. Except that it's never a great job when you do something against God's will. And marrying a person who does not believe in Yahweh was against God's will. 
Jezebel was the worst. I know I'm not supposed to say who the worst, but Jezebel was the worst. Scripture, Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal and that he built in Samaria, and right in the middle of Israel. In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he laid its, set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, the son of Nun. That's a lot of details. Don't get lost in the details here, but here's, what, here's what's going on there, all right? Ahab, evil king. Got it? Jezebel, more evil queen. Ahab and Jezebel, bad pair. Baal is the false god that Jezebel brought with her from Sidon. He's supposedly the god of the weather. So is Yahweh God or is Baal God? That's a question. It's going to come into contention. We're going to find out. How evil is Ahab? I just put these verses in there to show you how evil he was. He was very evil. Years before, God had said if anybody rebuilds Jericho, that person would only do so by sacrificing their children. And Jericho had not been rebuilt for 500 years because of that. But that didn't stop Ahab. Jericho, the name Jericho, Yerik, is the moon god. The moon god required child sacrifice. And so when Ahab rebuilt that city, he literally sacrificed his children in the fire to rebuild that city. That's how evil he is. The Bible says it's detestable to do that. He's very evil. Ahab is bad. So God sends Elijah, the prophet, to confront Ahab and Jezebel. And God decides to hit him where it hurts. And God decides to stop the rain and dry up the crops. Remember, Baal is supposedly the god of the weather, but he's pretty ineffective because he's not real. So on the one hand, you got Ahab worshiping Baal and sacrificing to Baal and all this kind of stuff, the moon god and to Asherah and whoever else, he's doing all these things. But on the other hand, Ahab knows deep down in his evil soul that Yahweh, the biblical God, is the true God. He knows it. And so when Elijah says, it's not going to rain, Ahab knows it's not going to rain. He knows who the true God is. And Ahab's ticked off about that. And Jezebel's ticked off. And they go and they say, we're going to murder Elijah if it's the last thing we do. And so God hides Elijah for three years and feeds him while, meanwhile, there's a famine throughout the land for three years. You can read about it in 1 Kings 17. And then in 1 Kings 18, it says, after a long time in the third year of the famine, the word of Yahweh came to Elijah. Go present yourself to King Ahab and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Elijah, God's prophet, demands to see Ahab. Ahab went to meet Elijah, and when he saw him, Ahab shouted, There you are, the biggest troublemaker in Israel! Elijah answered, You're the troublemaker, not me. You and your family have disobeyed the Lord's commands by worshipping Baal. You're the troublemaker. I love that line. However you pronounce Baal, the point is made here. That's who uh, Ahab is worshiping. Ahab has brought trouble on the whole nation of Israel because of that. Not because of his own personal private worship of Baal, that's bad enough, but because he led the whole nation to worship these false gods, even though he obviously knows the true God. Otherwise, why would he say Elijah's the troubler of Israel? Why would he blame the famine on Elijah? He knows the true God. All right, here we go. First Kings 18. So Elijah says, Summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and he assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went up to the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And the people said nothing. Elijah said to them, I am the only one of Yahweh's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the God who answers by fire, he's God. And the people said, what you say 
is good. Elijah said to Baal's prophets, there are more of you, so you go first. Pick out a bull and get it ready, but don't light the fire. Then pray to your God. They chose their bull. Then they got it ready and prayed to Baal all morning, asking him to start the fire. They danced around the altar and shouted, answer us, Baal! But there was no answer. At noon, Elijah began making fun of them. Pray louder, he said. Baal must be a god. Maybe he's daydreaming or, or using the toilet or, or traveling somewhere. Or maybe he's asleep and you have to wake him up. The prophets kept shouting louder and louder and they cut themselves with swords and knives until they were bleeding. This was the way they worshipped and they kept it up all afternoon. But there was no answer of any kind. Elijah told everyone to gather around him while he repaired the Lord's altar. Then he used 12 stones to build an altar in honor of the Lord. Each stone stood for one of the tribes of Israel, which was the name the Lord had given to their ancestor, Jacob. Elijah dug a ditch around the altar, large enough to hold about 13 quarts. He placed the wood on the altar. Then they cut the bull into pieces and laid the meat on the wood. He told the people, fill four large jars with water and pour it over the meat and the wood. After they did this, he told them to do it two more times. They did exactly as he said, until finally the water ran down the altar and filled the ditch. When it was time for the evening sacrifice, Elijah prayed, Our Lord, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel. Now prove that you are the God of this nation and that I, your servant, have done this at your command. Please answer me so that these people will know that you are the Lord God and that you will turn their hearts back to you. The Lord immediately sent fire and it burned up the sacrifice, the wood and the stones. It scorched the ground everywhere around the altar and dried up every drop of water in the ditch. When the crowd saw what had happened, they all bowed down and shouted, The Lord is God! The Lord is God! Of course, in the original, it's Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God is what they're shouting. And I love this cartoon. I think it's really great. But one thing about using a cartoon is it doesn't lend itself to the majesty, to the awe of this event. It's a cartoon, so it kind of makes it look kind of funny and kid-like of necessity. It's a cartoon. But the whole thing is really, when you think about the scene and picture it, it's quite awe-inspiring, actually. Remember the meaning of Elijah's name. Yahweh is God. That's what they cry out. Yahweh is God. His very name is a testimony uh, to the true God and which God is a sock puppet in its place. It's not even a contest. Yahweh wins the contest. So what happens after all this? Well, Yahweh showed that Baal, the God of the weather, is worthless. The Baal is nothing. And now God's going to show that he's the one who not only holds off the rain, but who brings the rain. Elijah said to Ahab, go and drink, for I hear the sound of heavy rain. And sure enough, a cloud as small as a man's hand appeared over the Mediterranean. And all of a sudden, the whole sky grew dark and the rain started to fall, kind of like it's been raining around here lately. And all of Israel was watered by God in a way that no sprinkler system could ever do. And that's how the story ends. It's a very cool story, actually. God sends fire from heaven to demonstrate his power over all things in an awesome way. And then... He beats the crap out of his enemies as well. I forgot to tell you, actually, the end of the story is that 450 prophets of Baal, the people took them all down to the river Kishon, which was hardly a river by that point, and murdered them all there, and their Kishon River ran with their blood, it says. It's a huge victory for God. Oh, that God would win a victory like that for us today, wouldn't you think? Oh, that God would show those muckety-mucks who the real God is. That God would come down with fire and brimstone, again, not, not against us sinners, of course, not against us, but against the real sinners, against the real bad people. Well, that's not actually how the story ends. I mean, that happens, but then there's more. Here's the ending. King Ahab told Jezebel 
the queen, evil queen, everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me ever so severely if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. And Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. <clears throat> he went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came to a broom bush and he sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Yahweh, he said. Take my life, I am no better than my ancestors. So check out what happens here on the map. Elijah is so scared of Queen Jezebel. Even after all of God's power, he's so scared of Jezebel that he runs 120 miles from Mount Carmel in the north, that little red circle, all the way down to Beersheba in the south, way down the south, 120 miles, way out of Jezebel's reach. And even then, he's still scared. Apparently, seeing God do this great miracle doesn't always translate into having great faith. So heads up, that's a lesson there for us. Apparently, seeing God do this great miracle didn't necessarily translate into Elijah's heart and having a stronger faith in God. Which is maybe why God doesn't do quite so many lightning strike type things today because it turns out they don't really help us all that much. It turns out that we're either gonna have faith or we're not gonna have faith and all the miracles in the world aren't really going to change anything when we face the super hard stuff in the world. So God doesn't take Elijah's life though, even though Elijah says, take my life. In fact, God gives him food and gives him more food and then he sends him 200 miles further south away from Queen Jezebel to Mount Sinai, which is the, in the Bible, if you read it, it says Mount Horeb. It's the same place, Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai. It's the mountain we read about last Sunday. If you were here last week, if you weren't, check the sermon out online. Moses, we saw last Sunday, went up Mount Sinai and talked with God. Got the 10 commandments there and all that. We saw God with Moses make a covenant, make an agreement with his people on Mount Sinai. Elijah goes all the way back, 320, 340, whatever it is, miles from Mount Carmel to Mount Sinai and goes there and meets with God, just like Moses had met with God. And what does he say to God? He says to God, I have been very zealous for Yahweh, for God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. In other words, he's saying to God, the covenant you made with Moses 600 years ago, on this mountain right here, that covenant is over. Nobody believes it anymore. It's gone. It's finished, dead, kaput. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me too. And God responds to Elijah and he says, buck up, young man. We got work to do. The covenant's not dead. It's bad, but it's not all that bad. Actually, God says to Elijah, there's 7,000 other people who have not bowed the knee to Baal. We're gonna keep going, Elijah. We're gonna give this another shot and I got work for you to do and here's your list of stuff to do. And God gives him his marching orders and sends him away from Mount Sinai. So I wanna close the story this way. I wanna take you to another mountain. We've been through a lot of mountains, Mount Carmel, all the way down south, Mount Sinai. I wanna take you to another mountain. We don't know for sure which mountain this event happened on, but we think it's way at the top of this map on the right-hand side of the map dark blue on the map. This is what happens. This is 800 years after Elijah. About eight days after Jesus, so now we're at the time of Jesus. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James, and John with him and went up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. We call this the transfiguration. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. And they spoke about his departure, which he was gonna to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Do you hear that? Who does Jesus meet on the Mount of Transfiguration? He meets Moses and Elijah, the two guys who were at the top of Mount Sinai talking to God. Moses was up there, we talked about it last Sunday, getting the covenant from God. Elijah was up there telling God, hey, that covenant you gave to Moses, that agreement we had, that, 
That's gone. It's dead. It's in shambles. What were those two guys who met with God on Mount Sinai talking with Jesus about at the Mount of Transfiguration? It says Jesus' departure. They were talking about, with Jesus about his departure. That means his death. Why? Because the first covenant given on Mount Sinai to Moses, reaffirmed with Elijah, not only was in shambles, but by that point it was dead. It, could, it was proven it could not do what, was, what it was supposed to accomplish. It could not give eternal life. And so now Jesus, God in the flesh, is gonna bring into effect a new covenant. And Jesus talks about that with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Why? Because the, because the old agreement that was given to Moses could never do what it was supposed to do. This new covenant that was gonna happen, that Jesus was gonna bring about with his death, is not about following a bunch of laws. It's different than the other one. This new covenant was about faith. It's about trust. Trust that Jesus' death would accomplish what the old covenant never could. Trust that Jesus' death could give the gift of forgiveness, that his sacrifice his death would be a sacrifice of atonement for us. So the point is there's a direct line here between these mountains, between Mount Sinai, last week with Moses in the covenant, and Mount Carmel and Elijah going down to Mount Sinai this week, and the Mount of Transfiguration. There's a direct line that happens there between all these mountains. So what do I wanna take home today? This is what I, I wanna take home. I encourage you to take it home, that God, did a very sweet miracle with Elijah and the fire and all that stuff. That, that, that was just awe-inspiring. Yahweh's God! It's a great statement. And yet, it's better, and we should look for God's power at work in small things, in humble things, in things that we don't notice, that look like nothing. And those small things are exemplified by the cross of Jesus. It looks like a defeat, doesn't it, the cross? And yet that's where God accomplished so much. The, the great fire from heaven at the time of Elijah might have converted a few people to say, oh, Yahweh's God, but that went away pretty quickly. But the humble crucifixion of Jesus has brought millions into the kingdom of God. God works most often and best through the small, humble things. It's not even a contest. The cross wins. Let's stand.